what I'd like to share with you regarding my own research is I have a piece that is uh, in the works and will hopefully come out sometime next year that's entitled Critical and Revolutionary Theory. I'm not going to walk you through all of the details of the argument because you would probably be um, bored by the nuances and details and footnotes, but I'd like to give you a sense of the broad uh, framework of analysis because personally for me it has been a very helpful process insofar as I was brought up and educated within uh, Western institutions, you know, within the United States and within France, and that there's a dominant understanding of what critical theory is. And there are really two features to that. The specific understanding of critical theory is that it is a tradition of thought that emerged in the Frankfurt School in the early 20th century with thinkers like Horkheimer, Adorno, um, Marcuse, with the affiliated you know, participation from a distance of people like Benjamin, Eric Fromm was involved early on, etc. And then this developed over the years into a second generation with the work of Jürgen Habermas, a third generation with Nancy Fraser, uh, Sheila Benabib, Axel Haneth, and others. This specific understanding of critical theory is rooted in, and this is what I'll get into in a moment, a certain heritage that comes out of Marxism. And in fact, one of the early uh, ideas was to name the Frankfurt School the Institut for Marxismus, the Institute for Marxism. And they understood themselves as setting up a research institute to at once um, call transdisciplinary work from a Marxist perspective that would provide us with a systemic analysis while also addressing the quintessential question of why the revolution was unsuccessful in Germany. And for anyone, I know Jamie and a few others have worked on this, the question of the revolution in Germany is of world historical importance in the early part of the 20th century because you had the first successful anti-capitalist revolution that happened in Russia in 1917. And it seemed that Germany was gonna follow suit. It did not for a lot of complex, but very important historical reasons. And so it became the focal point of the Institute in its very, very early years. I'll say more about that in, in a second. The broader understanding of critical theory is of course that critical theory is a kind of tradition of Western European thought that has not only been nourished by the Frankfurt School, but by French theory, and then by certain American theorists who've largely been influenced by French and German theory in various ways. You know, if this be Judith Butler or other such figures influenced by Foucault and others. And so there's this more expansive understanding of critical theory, which is working out of the Western philosophic tradition and trying to develop tools to address specific aspects of uh, the contemporary world, right? Just saying that very broadly. This broader understanding of critical theory does not self-define as Marxist, does not usually identify with the Marxist tradition, and in many ways is recalcitrant to certain forms of the Marxist tradition, which I, it identifies as being reductivist, simplistic, teleological, old school, and other such things, right? In relationship to that, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you read Michael Parenti is that, in my opinion, he's one of the most important intellectuals of the 20th century. I would even say hands down, because he has given us one of the most significant accounts of the history of global politics, economics, culture, and propaganda of any other thinker. But I know no one who would think of him as a critical theorist. Uh, he's never included in any of the, you know, academic publications on critical theory. He's been um, not only sidelined, but he was chased out of the university uh, very early on because of his activism against the war in Vietnam, which was a global war against a racialized, uh, the racialized poor, right? Um, and the, the, the uh, well, the communists in, in Vietnam. And that juxtaposition, I think, gives us a really interesting insight into two figures of the intellectual in the 20th century, right? Max Horkheimer, who I'll say a lot more about in a moment, is one of the founding fathers of critical theory. I'll explain what his precise relationship was to Marxism in a second. But you have already in these figures a dividing line between a kind of activist-oriented form of theoretical production. Parenti, I've never seen actually referenced by any academic but I don't think I've ever met or I've very rarely met activists who don't know Michael Parenti's work and who don't read it, which is extremely telling, right, about this kind of division of labor. But it also speaks volumes about the invisibilization of certain forms of theoretical practice and the hyper-visibilization of other forms of theoretical practice. 
the reason that I think that this is important is also because given what I just said about the crisis of the contemporary moment, I think it's really important for all of us to be vigilant about what we mean by doing critical work or critical theory. And if we know this history better, we can position our own theoretical practices in such a way that they might be more highly relevant, might have more use value, and might actually help to solve some of the problems that are, you know, I, I named a few of them. There are many, many more that we could, we could point out. And so the structure of the argument in this piece is, uh, in a nutshell, that the tradition that has been codified in the Western world is that of, tr tr of critical theory is actually woefully lacking in critique. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that it has turned its back on the Marxist tradition and has rejected certain fundamental modes of analysis that were integral to this tradition, while at the same time attempting to redefine critique within the framework of liberal ideology. And what I mean by liberal ideology is not what some political scientists try to define as liberal ideology within the US context. Uh, this is one of the classic games of the production of a false antagonism. You say, oh, there's the liberals who are over here and they think people should be you know, X, Y, or Z, and there's the conservatives and they think this over here. But actually the liberals and the conservatives in the United States almost across the board agree on the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are that capitalism is the optimal system of social and economic organization. And so when I say liberal ideology, I mean the historical ideology that was produced in continuity with global capitalism as it emerged out of Europe as a racializing colonial project, right? That is liberal ideology writ large. And part of what the tradition of critical theory has done through its three generations is it severed its Marxist roots and it's redefined critical theory as a form of liberal ideology. And I'll say more about that in a moment, but this has unbelievably important consequences for doing so-called critical work in the contemporary conjuncture. And one of the reasons that I've been working on this piece is uh, one of the professors I once had made a joke about me and he said, you know what, Rock Hill, all your work is just an extended Bildungsroman. And a Bildungsroman is, uh, is this kind of like 19th century genre, of course, where someone, usually it's a young male who talks about the, I didn't think about the homoerotic uh, subtext to this, but maybe there was one that I should talk to my therapist about. But uh, a Bildungsroman is the idea that, um, you know, a young male usually would talk about their emergence into their uh, sexuality and adult life and other such things. And so the whole novel is a kind of coming to age novel, if you will. And I think that what the professor meant by this is that a lot of my work is, ends up being self-reflexive, meaning I want to try to understand why it is that I was conditioned to think that this thing was critical theory and nobody ever told me that this thing was critical theory. And to really understand that, you have to do a systemic analysis that sees the big picture and a historical analysis that plumbs the depths of what produced that system in the first place, right? So it's not an individualist Bildungsroman, which would be quintessentially uninteresting for anyone perhaps other than my therapist, um, but it is instead a collective or an attempt at a collective understanding of what a Bildungsroman would be. And so just giving you the broad arc of this argument and cutting out all of the footnotes, the way in which um, the uh, critical theory tradition emerged is originally in dialogue with and purportedly as an extension of historical materialism as the Marxists understood it. And when I say Marxism or we talk about Marxism, I hope that everyone can bracket um, if you've been in an academic setting, the majority of what you heard about Marxism, because as Parenti points out, uh, the classic game of academics is to misrepresent Marxism, attack the misrepresentation of Marxism, and then claim to be post-Marxist. And this work gets us nowhere because it's a misrepresentation of Marxism in the first place. So it's a straw person, right? Attacking a straw person does nothing more than reveal the ignorance of the person attacking the straw person, right? And so three things that are important to understand about historical materialism. One is that it is neither empiricism in a positivistic sense, nor is it idealism, right? It's not just a set of ideas, nor is it saying, oh, there are these brute facts that exist autonomously out there in the world. Materialism is attempting to cull from empirical data, the reasons for the production of that empirical data, 
and provide an explanation of that empirical data. So there's always conceptual work going on. The opposition between the mind of idealism and the kind of brute body of empirical data is rejected. And you see Horkheimer doing this very clearly and very well in the piece that you read. And instead there's at worst, I would say a kind of dialectical relationship between the two, but at best these oppositions disappear because it's an idealist opposition. The mind is always working through and processing imperial data, empirical data, and that's what materialism is doing. But it's doing that, and this is the second aspect, through an evolving form of explanation. Historical materialism is not a dogma. It never has been. It is an attempt to constantly historically refine the mode of analysis so its materialist explanation is better, more complex, more rooted in the shifting sands of the realities that are being evaluated. So it is quintessentially a dynamic and self-critical science, right? And usually from the point of view of bourgeois science, people can't get this because bourgeois science tends not to be dynamic and self-critical in the same way. Right? The, what that would mean is that you can't refute historical materialism as a dogma because there isn't a dogma there to refute. You would have to go through a materialist analysis and produce a better explanation of the phenomena that are being analyzed. And if you don't do that, you have not refuted historical materialism right? because it's not an abstract idealist system. And the majority of bourgeois refutations of the straw person of Marxism are a refutation of idealist, hence false constructions of what they think historical materialism is. The third aspect that I wanna highlight is that historical materialism is not just materialist in the sense that I've explained, and also historically evolving and dynamic, but it is also focused on the use value of theory to intervene in precise historical conjunctures in order to change the very nature of that material reality. It is not describing things and saying, we don't know how things can change. We don't know where they came from. We don't know what can be done. No, the very premise of historical materialism is a dynamic ongoing account of the system of relations so that one can identify how best to change that system of relations. This was the source point for early critical theory. Uh, and when German style critical theory was first founded, they, uh, as I mentioned earlier, particularly under the leadership of Karl uh, Grunberg, they asserted that the Institute was Marxist and it was following Marxist scientific methodology in this precise sense. They focused on labor politics and other such things. They were also internationalists. They were um, in correspondence with Moscow and other such things. When Max Horkheimer though, took over as the director of the Institute in the late 1920s, there was a decisive shift away from a more materialist mode of analysis to speculative reflections and academic research that was increasingly distant from both historical materialism and labor politics. Uh, Gillian Rose is somebody who's pointing this out. Um, one of the things that Gillian Rose wrote is that, oh, critical theory in its first generation was supposed to politicize the academy. But instead of politicizing academia, it academicized politics. Right? So it took the, the Marxist heritage and it tried to bleed it back into a certain Hegelian heritage, a set of philosophic debates, and it began to lose the distinction between idealist forms of philosophic analysis like you find in Hegel and materialist forms and recognize that actually these aren't differences of degree, they're differences of kind. In that regard, Horkheimer is a, a particularly telling example of how that tradition consolidated itself early on. Uh, Horkheimer himself in his own politics claimed that, quote, we don't want people to say that our writings are so terribly radical. Whoever does not work should not be allowed to eat. That's the point at which we must attack the social democrats. So he wasn't involved in political organizing. Um, he wasn't a party member. And he was critical of the social democrats who were reformist electoral Marxists. So he was to the right of electoral Marxism and hence far to the right of revolutionary Marxism. And as his career evolved, particularly when the critical theory, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Institute for Social Research as it ended up being called, was originally founded in Frankfurt and then migrated to the US um, during the Nazi rise to power in the, the 1930s. And once in the US context, Horkheimer went out of his way to police the publications, the public visibility, 
of the critical theorists and insisted on them not towing a political line, not weighing in on contemporary political issues, and censored the M word and the R word from their publications, Marxism and revolution. They were also supported by uh, the forms of Anglo-American techno-scientific sociology that were very widespread at the time and extremely well financed by the American corporatocracy and the network of foundations, because these were the forms of analysis that were purporting to develop a scientific account that was positivistic, that was not materialist and that was anti-Marxist. And so they received funding from organizations like the Jewish Labor Committee, the American Jewish Committee, the Rockefeller Foundation, the German Defense Ministry, yes, you heard that right, the German Defense Ministry, and the High Commissioner of Germany, which was the, the US government that was set up in West Germany after World War II. And so their financial backing was dependent upon both the corporate and governmental interests of pro capitalist uh, you know, parties in, in the Western world. And Horkheimer was very clear about towing that line. One of the great examples of this is that he uh, defended the war in Vietnam. Right? He thought that he, and he spoke out on this in public at one of the America Hoysa, which are the cultural institutes that were set up by the United States in order to promote American culture in a, a soft power war against communism in Germany at the time. And he claimed very uh, clearly and publicly that when the United States goes to war, it is to defend the Constitution and the rights of man. Um, not to, as everybody I think knows at this point in time, to indulge in global imperialism, to destroy nations that are trying to be uh, autonomous, and to control as well uh, labor pools, natural resources, and the global drug trade, which is a big part of the Vietnam War. All of that is left out of the analysis in the name of towing the line of his keepers. And of course, uh, many of his collaborators at that point in time also either supported directly this position that the first generation of critical theory was taking or condoned it implicitly by not speaking out against it. And I would like to say one important thing about that, and that is that it's often maintained that if one doesn't take a political position, that somehow one is apolitical or neutral. And this is one of the great myths that has ever been uh, you know, put forth. Uh, Walter Rodney uh, calls this out very clearly. He says, if you are not explicit about the positions that you are taking, we know what side you're on. And we know what side this faux apolitical neutral position is actually um, defending uh, in its silence on, on global imperialism, for, for instance, or other such things. Uh, in other words, being apolitical is a very, very explicit politics, right? It would be as if the Iraq war was happening today and someone was apolitical because you could just say, well, I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, or the war on uh, the racialized poor in the United States. You say, oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't really know where I stand on this. I'm just a specialized academic. And so one of the important things to recognize, what I refer to as the instrumentalized intellectual, right? Intellectuals have their politics first and foremost because they've been an instrumentalized by a system that produced them, that gave them a knowledge basis, and that taught them a particular worldview. And so they can be as apolitical as they want to be, they're always already instrumentalized by the system. So the real question is, what are you going to do about the fact that you're instrumentalized, right? And if you do nothing about it, then you're just a vehicle for the ideological forms that have constructed you in order to play a particular social role. In the case of Horkheimer, though, I'm thinking more of Adorno in this regard because of his well-known uh, distance from certain forms of politics. Horkheimer was quite explicit about it, right? Uh, he was explicit in his support of the uh, war in Vietnam. Um, he was also explicit in this case with Adorno in their support of the Western intervention in the Suez Canal uh, in 1956 when um, Israel, Britain, and France decided to invade Egypt. It was an act that was condemned by the United Nations as an act of imperial intervention. And um, uh, Adorno and uh, Horkheimer wrote, quote, no one even ventures to point out, and I should foreground as well the very explicit racism and the very explicit misunderstanding of international politics. So they write, no one even ventures to point out that these Arab robber states, this is Egypt, Arab robber states, and not only Egypt, right? All of the other Arab robber states, 
These Arab robber states have been on the lookout for years for an opportunity to fall upon Israel and to slaughter the Jews who have found refuge there. Uh, in this regard, they take a very, very explicit stance on global imperialism. Uh, Horkheimer flatly proclaimed, I believe that Europe and America are probably the best civilizations that history has produced up to now as far as prosperity and justice are concerned. The key point now is to ensure the preservation of these gains. Right? Meanwhile, other people like Martin Luther King are pointing out that his government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. The US has an incarceration rate that far surpasses any other country in the world. Like we could go on and on with the list of abuses on the, of the, the US driven global police state. They also defended West Germany as being a democracy as opposed to a fascist state, um, which is actually I could go into this in the Q&A, but I just have an eye on, on time. The Western government in Europe was propped up by the CIA, owned by the CIA. The intelligence services were controlled by the Central Intelligence Agency. The Adenauer government was regularly given cash uh, payments from the CIA. And we have ample, ample internal documents and the testimony of the CIA agents who were doing this. So it's unquestionable on every possible front that the Adenauer government was a propped up centrist government that worked hand in hand with former, I put this in quotes because I don't think there is such a thing as former, but former Nazis. And they accused the student activists who were militating against the capitalist driven apparatus of knowledge production and saying we had to change how knowledge was produced, circulated, and received, they accused them of being fascist, right? So the whole incident where Adorno, and it's not the only one, called the cops on the, um, the students, this is part of a much, much larger picture. And that is a rejection of the radical movements of the 60s um, and 70s, in the case of uh, you know, those who lived into the 70s, and a defense of the fascistically oriented Western pseudo-democracies. In that regard, the, um, the, juxtaposi the juxtaposition could not be clearer between the old and new left on the one hand, and then the tradition that emerges as critical theory on the, uh, on the other hand. So, right, the old left is often defined as the left that focuses on labor politics, uh, union organizing, party organizing, revolutionary organizing, et cetera. The new left is the term, of course, that people developed in the 60s and 70s to refer to um, the ways in which the left was also interested in sexuality, in gender, in race, and other such things. There are some problems with that distinction, primarily because the old left was anti-colonial, anti-racist. Um, the Russian Revolution was the most radical in relationship to gender revolutions in any revolution before or since, according to many, many analyses. And so that distinction is problematic. But what we see is both the old and the new left are rejected by the first generation of critical theory. Now, as that tradition evolves, and here I'm going to jump really quickly through some hoops. Um, just so that we can get onto a, a broader discussion. Uh, one thing that I'll just notice in passing is that some of my research, and this is one of the reasons I shared one of these pieces, is related to the soft power apparatus that has really conditioned how it is that theoretical communities are formed and how they're promoted. And both Adorno and Horkheimer had multiple ties to the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was revealed in 1966 as a CIA front organization. And the, cultural, uh, uh, the, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was an enormous endeavor to fuel uh, intellectual production by running journals internationally, translating books, publishing books, getting them reviewed, getting them promoted, getting people in the media spotlight and other such things internationally, right? They were running some, I think they had 35 um, different countries that had headquarters of the CCF, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Adorno Horkheimer had ties, very explicit ties. They published in their journals, etc. And one of the agendas of the Congress of Cultural Freedom was to cut off the communist left from the non-communist left and consolidate the non-communist left as the most radical form of theory possible. And so from our point of view, this might be a bit surprising, but when you think of how smart the ruling class hench people are, because they're all Ivy League trained, they have a lot of time, they have infinite resources. 
they understood very early on, Thomas Braden has written on this, who was one of the people, who, the CIA members who oversaw this operation and then wrote a famous piece called uh, The CIA yeah. is Immoral and I'm it's Glad About It. And he explained that the, I, the logic was the only people who really cared about fighting the communist left was the socialist left. And so you actually had to fund people who were to the left of the Democratic Party within the United States. So they didn't go through Congress to do this. They went behind the back of Congress and they really tried to drive a wedge. And that wedge, you see it today in American politics very clearly. And the thing is they almost didn't have to do it in American politics because it was already done in the thirties with the red purges and then the red scare in the post-war era. But you have a wedge that's driven between what we call the left in the United States and it's laughable from an internationalist and historical point of view. What we call the left is a pro-corporate, pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist party, right? That's not the left historically. The left historically, is the group of people who are critical of imperialism, critical of international racism, critical of capitalism, right? And so that wedge is one of the quintessential wedges. And I think it's important to identify how in the cultural apparatus and in the intellectual apparatus, we are the inheritors of that. And so one of the things that I'm particularly preoccupied is what I refer to as the policing of the left border of critique, right? By policing the left border of critique, what you do is you tell graduate students around the world, for instance, or faculty or artists or other such people, you know, if you really want to do something critical, you should look at this thing they call critical theory. And then you start looking at it and you're like, oh yeah, they, they like call Marxism out or, you know, they, they talk about these things like class and like struggle and other such things. It sounds pretty critical from certain vantage points, particularly in relationship to just hardcore liberal ideology. But what it ultimately does historically is it polices that left border of critique. So you read Horkheimer, but you don't read Parenti. Or, or you know about Nancy Fraser, but you don't read Angela Davis, right? Like this has really profound implications for the way in which these traditions have evolved. And I would like to say, um, and again, I'm gonna be very quick. You can either rest assured or shoot me an email and I can share it with you. There's a ton of footnotes, probably too many in what I've written. So I've tried to document this extremely well. But what happens in the evolution from this first generation of critical theory to the second and the third is really a complete consolidation of this project. So if historical materialism emerge as a critique of both liberal ideology as the dominant form of knowledge for capitalist social relations. That's one way of describing what historical materialism was doing. What you have in the first generation is the Marxist spirit in a certain sense, it's Marxian insofar as people use that term to say, yeah, it's kind of related to and inspired by the Marxist tradition, but it's not Marxist, right? So it's Marxian in the sense that there's a certain spirit. That spirit is then cut out entirely, right? So I would say that there's the spirit of Marxism without the substance in the first generation. In the second generation, you get no spirit of Marxism. You get the spirit of liberalism. And by the third generation, you get the core substance, and that is liberalism. And so there's this very interesting dialectic of history where you move from Marxism to the first generation, second generation, and third generation, and you've basically inverted history. So that by, by the time you get to the third generation of critical theory, the very definition of critique is shoring up liberal ideology, defending capitalism, and maintaining Eurocentrism as the central coordinate by which you would judge the entirety of history. Right? And there are, there are nuances within this, I'll allude to some really quickly, but then I do wanna get on to the, to the, um, to the, to the Q&A. So uh, Habermas, I'm gonna jump over really quickly. He was a member of the Nazi youth. He studied with Heidegger. Um, he was actually to the left of Horkheimer and Adorno on certain questions, but uh, over time, one of the things that happened is there was a splinter off from Horkheimer and Adorno Marcuse and four other members of the first generation of the critical theory uh, of critical theory worked for the deep state, right? They worked for the uh, Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor organization of the CIA. They worked for the uh, OWI, the Office of War Information, for the State Department, for Voice of America. This is the, the, the American deep state, right? And you had five members of the critical theory, uh, the first generation that were working for them. And I could say a lot more about them. One of them was actually a fascinating case, Franz Neumann. He was a turncoat because he was an undercover agent for the KGB. And it's a really fascinating aspect to this. And they might have contacted Marcuse. It's unclear if they actually reached out to Marcuse as a po possible double agent. But what's important about that is in Marcuse's uh, evolution, 
he was very marked by the radicalizing movements of the 60s and 70s, got on board with anti-imperialist, anti-racist critique, and one of his most important students was, of course, Angela Davis, who was a member of the Communist Party, very close ties with the uh, Black Panther movement within the United States, and a very easy way to understand the evolution of this history, and there are more offshoots than one, is that what you have is, on the one hand, the the conservative kind of Horkheimer Adorno line bleeds into Habermas and leads to Hanath. Hanath is really the quintessence of contemporary third generation critical theory because he's an unabashed liberal Eurocentric who thinks that capitalism and liberalism are the only and best games in, in town. And in fact, he just published a book called The Idea of Socialism where he tries to explain how this corresponds to the idea of socialism. So he is really a hench person for the type of system that I think we should all be opposed to. On the left hand, what you have is the Marcusean heritage that gets radicalized by the new left and by his students. And a really interesting thing about Marcuse is he listened to his students, right? And Angela Davis, who in many ways should be considered one of the most important figures in the third generation of critical theory has been completely cut out of that tradition. You read the major histories of critical theory. Uh, one of the only references to her is uh, Marcuse's former and controversial student who is a communist organizer, right? Not an intellectual. And so we see very clearly in this case that it's not only a political project, right, of policing that left border of critique and saying that's not critical theory. It's a racializing and explicitly racializing project. And it's also a gendered project, right? The fact that you'd have a black woman communist who doesn't count as a critical theorist, who is cut off from that tradition, speaks volumes about the evolution of that tradition. Um, I could say a lot more about this. I'm not getting into any of the details about the other figures, but maybe let me just close in the interest of having it be a more uh, dynamic interaction. We can call some questions. So don't hesitate. If you know that you wanna ask a question, start putting your, just put your name in the, in the chat. I just want to close by coming for a circle and say that the point of this exercise is not one of a kind of ad hominem attack on individuals and to say, oh, uh, Hanif is really uh, prominent right now. I have a daddy complex issue. I want to bring him down to earth or other such these kind of trite intellectual endeavors that are about ratcheting up one's individual capital in relationship to someone else. I find that that's kind of generally a waste of time. It's also not an imminent critique. I think that there are unbelievable limitations to what's called imminent critique, right? You analyze something and reveal the internal contradictions that are operative within it, et cetera, and you point that out. Some of that can be powerful and important work, but what I'm trying to do is uh, an analysis that takes its cues from the history of historical materialism and tries to understand what is the operative understanding of critical theory that functions within the primary mode of knowledge production, circulation, and reception in the globalized Western world. What is the system that has produced that, right? Why is it that I was brought up as an undergraduate reading Horkheimer and not Parenti and not Davis, for instance? But there's a lot of others. Ward Churchill, I could add a long list to the left. Um, and what are the structural elements that have organized that system of knowledge production? And what are the forces that are driving it? And finally, what can we actually do to address that, right? Because I take it that an individual critique is insufficient. It's insufficient to simply say, oh, well, all of these people were actually kind of reactionaries or apologists for the system in place. Um, I am the new prophet of this new way of thinking and I can find my new cult or, you know, found my new cult or something like that. That's not, that's not interesting, right? And it's also beholden to this individualist model of knowledge production. And so the thing that I would close on kind of coming full circle is that, uh, and without having any illusions about the limitations of a particular project or the contradictions that saturate it, I think that counter institutions of knowledge production, circulation, and reception are absolutely essential to building the forms of analysis and the type of power that we need to cultivate over time so that we aren't simply hecklers on the sidelines saying, ha, 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 look, that is not good. We could do much better. But instead, we could actually have both the knowledge base and the power base to displace the very nature of not only the conversation, but the practical implications for those conversations. Because of course, the use value of knowledge is a use value that is always anchored in its potential and its power to intervene 
in social, economic, political contexts in order to transform them. And that's one of the things that this critical theory tradition kind of uh, splintering off to the right has alienated us from in certain ways. Now, there are exceptions that we could go into and there are, um, you know, discrete moments within this tradition. But I just wanted to give you a kind of very big picture view of things. So Esteban, maybe you could unmute yourself and just state your question again. Sorry about that. Uh, greetings from Valparaiso, Chile. And well, thank you very much for the organization of this and for the, for the talk, of course. And well, my question is about um, well, your char characterization of historical materialism and, and uh, well, what could have went wrong about uh, the method or, or methods of historical materialism? Um, so that, well, the, the third generation of uh, critical theory uh, became, well, what what you described, uh, a liberalist, capitalist, and Eurocentric uh, uh, way of you know, thinking. So uh, basically the question is, uh, did something went wrong about, well, how, how the, 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 de the data was explained in terms of uh, historical change, uh, in the sense that maybe, well, historical, Materialism uh, in, in critical theory hasn't uh, hasn't been really uh, a, a historical materialist, but um, but just another way, of, uh, another kind of yeah. That, or, I think it's is there a problem. Is there a problem about the the the, the, the value issue about the, the, this thing you said that well it, it, does, it is it's not only important to to explain the, the data historical but to to change it so it, it may have been uh, uh, as I said uh, thinking about uh, about the third generation of critical theory was it the problem about a, a value of how, how to change uh, the, the system of relations? Or about the the other thing about the the, the, the data, how to, to explain the data. So I would say two things. One is that the uh, first part of your question really goes to the heart of how we understand the development evolution of ideas. And the idea that there could be something that would be inherently corrupt within a method and that that would be the kind of force of perversion that led to the consequences of the third generation of critical theory runs the risk of an idealist form of explanation. That is that it's a set of ideas that are inappropriate and it's those ideas that need to be revisited or changed because it led to these particular consequences. In my opinion, the best explanation though is a materialist explanation. And that is looking at what the material forces were that were driving the system of knowledge production that would lend uh, that system to a shift away from overt critiques of capitalism and colonialism and other such things in the name of a modality of critical theory that is highly professionalized, highly individualized, focused primarily on the echo chamber of the Western Academy, and interested in a series of debates that don't raise the larger value question that I take it that you might have been alluding to. What I mean by that is particularly in the third generation, there's a, a number of questions that are raised about how you legitimate or how you, yeah, how you legitimate a particular critical theory. And I won't go into the details of how some people have tried to do it in the past, but I would say that what's missing in this is that a very easy way of analyzing the use value of theory is how has it intervened historically and what have its consequences been? Right? So again, from a materialist as opposed to an idealist point of view. And in that regard, we don't do a judgment of value that's only internal, like, oh, Habermas's theory would be good because it's internally consistent or internally coherent, as opposed to, well, Habermas's system of explanation is alienating us from the deep history of 
capitalist social relations, colonialism, and other such things. He's not explaining these things. In fact, he's completely misrepresenting the history of the Enlightenment project as if it was about ideas and reason and communication and other such things as opposed to about a genocide of the indigenous population, mass slavery, colonialism, indentured servitude, and all the other things that it actually is. And that's the point of view from which we should judge the value of a particular theoretical project. Right? Not its internal consistencies, not its, uh, uh, or touchstones that it would elevate, but instead its use value in the project of developing, in short, a more egalitarian set of social and economic relations. Um, so sorry, I was mildly distracted, but this is a crash course in multitasking. Do I see other, um, you know, one issue is going to be, oh, I do see some other hands. This might be out of order, so apologies in advance, but I see Scott Branson. Do you want to unmute yourself and share your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, I was interested. I like the way that you've like tied this to your own experience of um, education and like kind of think being told this is one thing and then trying to figure out how to get to the actual like radical critique. And one thing that's interesting to me, I mean, I, I was also trained that way, obviously, um, is that people are with like, I don't know, desire to get plugged into revolutionary activity are drawn to critical theory or people associated with critical theorists. Um, so I'm wondering if you've thought about how that sort of fits in, like how can, I don't know if it's like an entry point for some people towards a radicalization, how do we think about the use of critical theory towards those ends? Um, especially since like institutionally, it's a, a kind of introductory point for a lot of people and then I have like the separate question and you don't have to answer this, but to what extent do you think the kind of institutional capture that like we see radical uh, critical, critical theory uh, comes from a sort of, you know, state statist direction of Marxism, you know, that like wants to be embedded in institutions and have power. Yeah, great question. So I would say that the one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the ways in which there's been a consolidation of theoretical history that's been driven by the capitalist apparatus of knowledge production and circulation. And so that the canons that we have, the kind of required reading and other such things are really based on that. And so it's important that what becomes defined as critical theory is this kind of critical theory that, that, that polices this left border. And in order to really call that into question, what you need is counter institutions in which the lingua franca is outside of the left police border, for instance. But you also need to, and this is already going on in so many places around the US and around the world, you need um, modalities of knowledge production that are not beholden to these imperatives of evaluation, credentials, and other such things. And so one of the, I think, the most important things uh, to recognize is that there is entire intergenerational history of communal knowledge production that is outside of the academy and it is focused on use value and it is generally foreclosed from the academy, right? And so when you have versions of critical theory like you have in the third generation that suggest that prior to their work, uh, there was this old school Marxist approach that wasn't interested in questions of um, gender and race and sexuality. What they're doing is they're taking out all of those communal forms of indigenous, black radical, Latino radical knowledge production. And they're saying, guess what? None of those exist. No, none of them exist. Um, this is all just about white men in factories or something like that. Ho Chi Minh disappears, Che disappears, like all of that disappears, right? And so I think that identifying the ways in which that capitalist apparatus of knowledge production really tries to consolidate and control and needs to be questioned not simply from an individual point of view, but we need to build more power and that political spaces are doing that, political parties are doing that, counter institutions are doing that, and that's a really important struggle, particularly at this moment, because, you know, as Lenin Mao and everybody else who has thought about the issue has really pointed out, you cannot have radical social transformation without a theoretical apparatus. And if you believe in spontaneity, that's your theoretical apparatus, right? So we need theoretical accounts that explain what it is that's going on. On the second point on the status aspect of Marxism, someone uh, raised this, I'm not sure exactly who in the Google Doc, and it's an important question because anarchism has of course not only been cut out of the academy, but people basically act as if it doesn't, doesn't exist. And anarchism is a very important, uh, generally anti-capitalist form of leftist critique that has cultivated 
knowledge and spaces of knowledge production for decades and decades. And the main conflict usually between Marxists and anarchists is around the question of the state and state power. I would say that the Marxists have no particular fetishization of the state. On the contrary, the goal is to live in a stateless society. The real question, and that's where there are conflicts with anarchists, is how do you get there? And the Marxist position is that the state control of capitalist social relations is so powerful and so awesome in its force and violence that if you do not mobilize state power to crush state power, then that state power will crush you, right? So there's an agreement about the strategy, right? The end goal that we want to arrive at, which would be a stateless capitalist, uh, anti-capitalist society that's more egalitarian, that's um, not structured by racism, misogyny, and other such things. But the tactic of how to get there is the major question in the dividing line between the anarchist and Marxist tradition, which isn't to say that they can't work together on a million and one projects, right? If you're not storming the Winter Palace, anarchists and communists can work together, right? It's only at real moments of crisis when state power is a possibility that then you start to run into certain conflicts. Um, I see that there's, I'm gonna unmute, I think it's Leah who's at the bottom. The name is not uh, readily identifiable, but I see the hand up. Would you like to jump in? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, now you're yeah, there. I think I've just done that. Yes, my yes, I'm Leah. Thank you. Um, I, I like the language and the idea that that you gave with the policing the left border of critique. I, I think that that's right on and uh, a great image to be using. And I want to um, pick up on that to ask about the relationship between theory and action. In, in other words. And uh, let me situate this, I, I think, in, in the concrete, which will be easier to express myself. Um, so obviously, in order to be able to act on X in a transformative way, we first need to be able to think about X and name X. Um, if we situate this uh, in terms of racial justice, we can see now, I think, how um, there's a, a certain intellectual pickup of, of critical race theory, let's say, or radical race theory on the part of the, the general population. People are now able to see the certain injustices that exist, which they weren't able to see in, say, 50 years ago, or they weren't able to see with the same level of diffusion 50 years ago when the height of the Black radical tradition was in its, its, its uh, top moment of intellectual production, let's say. And so now we have kind of the police border of critical race theory and so forth that ejects from the tradition, uh, the, the, the black radical tradition and so forth. Uh, but there's been a, a societal level pickup of, of, of the ideas in a way that makes them actionable. So that's the situation, but uh, of, of maybe a semi-successful or and route to successful transformation. But there are lots of other uh, X's out there about which we can be critical and about which there's a black radical tradition equivalent thinking and saying outside the standard structures of knowledge production. Um, and to give one example that comes to my mind is something like the anti-psychiatry movement. So you've got in the academy, you've got a critical, critical disability studies, um, critical medical studies, things like this. And then way outside, you've got this anti-psychiatry movement that says, wait a minute, like the black radical tradition, we are uh, protesting a carceral uh, pharmacocapitalist uh, form of domination and so forth. And, and yet within the police boundaries, that's an unthinkable thought. And, and so I think it becomes, it, it's inactionable uh, on, on the social plane. So I guess my thought there is uh, how, how do you derive the action from the thought that is so periphery? Or how do you transform a peripheral thought to one that is more widely capturable? Yeah, great. No, thank you for that. Just very quickly on stack because I lost track a little bit. So raise your hand again if I don't say your name, but I did see 
uh, and apologies for any mispronunciations, Shauna, Naomi, Thomas, and Trine. If you do have another question, do use the raise hand function. I, I tried to go through Stack if you can, otherwise I'll keep an eye on the chat. That's an excellent question. I don't think I can speak in any uh, compelling or authoritative fashion about anti-psychology, so I'm gonna take the first half of the question if that's okay, but I think they're related. And that is that there is a way in which there's a historical triage of forms of knowledge production that I think needs to be studied and understood so that when there are forces that are pushing up from below, such as the forces that you saw in the 60s and 70s that were uh, the kind of anti-racist uh, movements from below, like the Panthers that you mentioned, and that the establishment needs to manage those forces in certain ways. It can't simply ignore them. And usually they have two ways of managing them, at least. One is repressive, right? And this is, you know, classic Gramscian analysis. The repressive state apparatus is the one that subjects them to police punishment, assassination, and other such things. So 29 members of the uh, Black Panther Party were killed by the FBI and the various, you know, criminal elements that they were working with, including the police force. That's the repressive apparatus. But you also need the hegemonic apparatus. The hegemonic apparatus is the cultural mode by which you tell certain stories and you paint a particular image of what the academy is, could be, et cetera. And so the relationship between, if you take the Black Panther Party in the 60s and 70s, all of whom, I, I don't think without exception, correct me if I'm wrong, were outside of the academy, majority of whom were in prison, you know, at some point in their lives. And you compare that to uh, certain very prominent, highly visible discourses that are referred to as the critical philosophy of race in contemporary US academy and its kind of globalized forms. There are very important discrepancies that should be highlighted and interrogated. Um, without going into any detail, I'll just point out a few very quick ones. So the Black Panther Party was rooted in practice, right? And theory, it was very influenced by a Maoist form of Marxism in which it's all about practice theory, practice theory, practice. There's no such thing as practices out there. I think about something over here and then I go over. No, they're constantly in a dialectical articulation in which you theoretically frame something, you try something out, it doesn't quite work, you need to reframe it, and you're, you're constantly doing this. And so that's one very important aspect of their knowledge production, but they were anti-capitalist. They, they did transracial organizing, particularly with the Rainbow Coalition by Fred Hampton in Chicago, uh, organizing with indigenous, uh, the American Indian movement, Ward Churchill was there at the time, organizing with the, I think they were called the Young Patriots. Um, I think I said in a nutshell, everything that I wanted to, at least quickly about the BPP, and just the remarkable difference there is between that particular tradition and what presents itself as the critical philosophy of race. Um, the studies of Fanon would be really telling in this regard because there's a, an entire industry around taking Fanon from a, a revolutionary, anti-colonial thinker and turning him into a kind of psychologizing uh, reference point for a particular experience that is idiosyncratic and not related to uh, the broader system of, of colonial capitalism. I could say more about that, but I'll uh, leave it at that. Shauna, I think you were next. Would you like to unmute and share your thoughts? Um, hi, thank you for that, um, you know, um, this is a very exciting lecture and there was so much that I learned from it. Um, I think my question was more about uh, where does post-colonial theory fit into this large picture of critical theory? Um, and by post-colonial theory, I, just, I don't just mean the project of provincializing Europe, but also the larger project of how various apparatuses of, um, you know, uh, ideological state apparatuses were created um, in the colony. Um, so the passport borders and, you know, different systems of policing were actually uh, first created in the colony. And the colony wasn't just a site for extractive practices, it was also a site for, you know, the creation of these institutions. Um, and there's a way in which, of course, the first generation of post-colonial scholars didn't necessarily look at this. And now, you know, there is a lot of historical writing about it, but how do we take it into, um, you know, how do we begin to theorize about it? Thank you. No, it's the colonial question is absolutely essential because you can have no account 
of capitalism if you don't have an account of, of colonialism, right? It's how the world system was produced was by subjecting the overwhelming majority of the world's population to the imperatives of capitalist social relations. I was just saying that in relationship to post-colonial theory, I think one of the other things that's important is to really identify how the US Academy tends to function as a global arbiter for what counts as really important theoretical work and to look at the ways in which global traditions of communal knowledge production have been subjected to that triage and what has been cut out for what reasons and why. And so in the case of post-colonial theory, I mean, there are many different parts of this tradition, but there are very significant critiques. I'm thinking in particular of the one developed by Anya Lumba, but there are others that look at how it emanated out of um, certain uh, forms of knowledge production in India, many of which are very, very important, but that also then sidelined particular questions regarding caste. And it had a kind of class background to them that was not announced as such. And there's also a very questionable relationship between the ways in which these forms of knowledge are credentialed in relationship to the dominant theoretical paradigms within Europe, right? So it's not surprising to have somebody from an upper caste in India who's trained in Europe and America, who knows the fancy and sophisticated discourses and can purportedly link the subaltern to these fancy and sophisticated discourses while at the same time generating extremely lucrative individual career out of that model, right? I think we might know some of the people that I'm thinking of. I would recommend very highly in this regard uh, Sylvia Rivera Kizikanki's account of decolonial theory within the United States because she looks, and we should always do this, at who are the theorists coming out of Latin America who are integrated into the kind of, uh, you know, the pantheon of great thinkers of decolonial thought and what are the forces behind that, right? What is Duke as an institution doing? What is Mignolo as a person and his contacts doing to all of the forms of local knowledge that are produced across Latin America or in the Spanish speaking world in general? One of the things that she points out is that what you tend to get is a sanitized version that cuts out real radical thinkers and particularly activist thinkers in the name of those who once again are connecting some, some altering question to a highly uber sophisticated theoretical discourse and then using that to leverage their way into these kind of broader academic structures. Now, all of that is just kind of from the perspective that I outlined earlier, but the last thing that I would say is that, of course, an account of colonialism, I kind of highlight that very quickly, needs to be part of this. And just echoing back to the earlier question, one of the absolutely essential arguments that's made by um, George Jackson and other members of the Black Panther Party is they refer to the Black experience, they don't refer to it as exceptional in, in one very precise sense, they say that we are the Black colony because you have to understand the history of Black people as part of the history of colonization. That's why we were brought here, we were brought here as laborers, you can't disconnect the racial aspects from the class aspects, and so you need a systemic colonial critique, otherwise you cut off these various kind of aspects of social existence, if you will. Um, should we go on to Naomi? I believe you've had your hand up for a while. If you could unmute yourself, I don't think. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so first and foremost, I'd just like to thank you for that um, historiography that you provided on critical theory. And my question more so was kind of, um, this is the first, my first time ever like engaging with critical theory formally um, and certainly in an academic context. And so I was wondering if you could help me kind of reconcile like how I know critical theory and the historiography that you presented. And so from the way that I understand like critical theory, I understand it to have, I understand it to be like a lowercase c, lowercase t critical theory than an uppercase c, uppercase t critical theory. That uppercase one referring to the Frankfurt School and that lowercase one referring to a broader tradition of um, critiques of inegalitarian, oppressive, exploitative um, power relations and dynamics. Mm -hmm. And um, so like when um, I like kind of have been, so the, the first generation of like critical theorists that you mentioned from the Frankfurt School, like I'm familiar with their works. I'm familiar with Habermas in the second, but like after that, not really. They don't really enter the discourse that I'm, but the way that I understand critical theory. Um, and so I was wondering like if you could help me like reconcile those two because like the way that 
I understand critical theory is more so in that lowercase c, lowercase t tradition that links like critical race theory, um, feminist theory, queer theory, post-colonial studies, and et cetera, into like a unifying discourse and the Frankfurt School kind of being like um, a articulator of like the methodological component that was uniting and linking all of these different discourses. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great uh, question. I would say that at a certain level, the more kind of ubiquitous form of critique, this this lowercase ct that is referring to how all of these different discourses are 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 linked and feeding into one another in various ways, is you know one widespread and important understanding of what critical theory is or should be in certain ways. But I would also just signal that. I think there are different ways of linking these elements together. And so tying into what I was saying about the tradition of the critical philosophy of race or post-colonial studies, there are many ways in which there is a kind of critical theory light, if you'll allow me the expression, which really consists in dabbling in, you know, a bit of feminism. Everybody knows that, you know, it's better to be uh, up on recent debates in queer sexuality, or, you know, there, there are certain things that people in the academy and outside of the academy as well generally know as, like, these are the critical thought pieces of the day, right? And one of the risks in that, and I think it's a really significant risk, is the assumption that, well, just talking about or focusing on race and racism or gender issues or sexuality or, uh, you know, how bodies are constructed and other such things, that just focusing on these is enough. I don't think it's enough. I think that the real question has to be, what is your structural framework of analysis, right? There's lots of people who have talked about racism. There's lots of people who have talked about sexuality. Um, if I could just pick up on sexuality because we haven't talked that much about it, you know, people talk about queer theory as being a coherent tradition. I don't see it as a coherent tradition at all. I think that there is a form of queer theory that is linked to radical, activism that is militating for different types of spaces, different types of sexual politics, a complete transformation of social relations that are bound up with capitalism, with the domestic slavery that women have disproportionately been subjected to, with a whole series of other very material struggles. And then there's a form of queer theory that is very rampant in the academy, that passes itself off as critical, that generally operates within the framework of liberal politics, and is often even apologetic of imperialism, police tactics, and other such things, right? So there can be traditions like this of queer theory, and within them, what we have to be attentive to is, yeah, there's class struggle in theory. Althusser has a great line that he repeats often, you find it in Lenin and philosophy, for instance, and he says, well, we have to recognize that in every theoretical debate, there is class struggle. And that there are those who are trying to, and I would refer to these people, I think that it's a social role that we play. And the reason I'm so hard on them is because that's what I was supposed to do. I would have had a much better internet connection, more lucrative job and traveling the world. I refer to these people as radical recuperators. They live within the academy. They know there's these radical discourses that are pushing up and people are trying to transform the world, but they want their petty bourgeois lifestyle. And so they recuperate these discourses. They uh, use a form of kind of sanitizing discourse that sheds all of the kind of dirty material elements and makes it into a discourse that's much more palatable to the petty bourgeoisie and it sounds critical and is in certain ways in relationship to particular discourses usually within the academy but actually is severed from this more radical materialist tradition and so I juxtapose critical theory light if you will to, I don't know what we want to call it. Uh, I would call it revolutionary theory. Um, we could call it critical theory with some teeth. Uh, critical theory that recognizes that actually, th there's this great piece by Marx that some of you might know um, that really highlights that everything needs to be subjected to critique. And anybody working in the academy knows today, there are certain things that can't be, right? There are certain discourses that are absolutely policed. And if you come out in public and you say, well, there are reactionary queer theorists and there are revolutionary queer theorists and we should distinguish between the two, there's gonna be a lot of angry people who will accuse you of various things, right? And so I think it's also important to, uh, to, to not be too beholden to an idea that 
oh, just talking about something is enough or just participating in a particular discourse. What really matters is like, where are you staking out your position and what are the consequences of that position? And if the consequences are that you're radically recuperating a revolutionary discourse to make it palatable for the petty bourgeoisie and leverage up your career, then we should be able to identify those people and say, well, I'm not that interested in that. I'm interested in this other stuff, like a queer politics that actually transforms the material reality that I'm living in, not only one that integrates me into an apparatus of knowledge production that stratifies society, for instance. Um, I know that Thomas and Trang both had their hands up at one point. Maybe Thomas, we could start out. If you can Sure, sure. can you hear now. me? Yeah. Um, cool, so I think this is actually a great question to have after what you just said, because this may be some sort of different type of radical recuperator, but I've seen, um, well, let me say it this way. Uh, since from the perspective of the use value of knowledge and from a, a radical theoretical project, it obviously isn't just to say we should read Davis instead of Habermas, though that might be part of it. Um, what is what should be our stance besides saying that there are these material influences to say obviously in the case of Heidegger Heidegger is the person I don't have like a particular affinity toward but know more about um, what is there a part of the revolutionary theory theoretical project that is recovering those kernels of genuinely critical or useful or um, revolutionary pieces of, say, Heidegger, that should be included in our work. Great. No, that's, that's a, it's, I think, an important question, because you could take Heidegger, you could take Foucault, you could take a lot of figures, you could take Spivak. Um, and I do think there's a way in which what the academy tends to do, and everybody has to, if you're in the academy, deal with these constraints in various ways, is usually you have to you know, engage with the work of a, a particular canon, even if you are calling for a counter canon or criticizing that canon or whatnot. And one way of doing that is you find the particular seeds within them in order to tease out how there might be a line of thought or a particular tradition that would be of interest. My reaction to that has always been, you know, looking for Foucault, someone I've, I've worked a ton on, and looking for really important seeds within Foucault is kind of like, you know, a seagull at the beach looking for like one or two shells and the beach is hundreds of miles long. Uh, why would I do that? Like, why would I take that much time to do that instead of just going over to that beach where there's all shells? Right? Why don't you just go over and read Michael Parenti or Dominica Lasordo or Angela Davis or all of these people who are unbelievably uh, important resources and tap into that work, right? Um, because the only reason I think to look for the seeds is because you have to navigate that territory. And I get that and I've done that, but it is much, uh, and, and it, it really speaks volumes about the exchange value of knowledge, right? You have to find the seeds within the reactionary. And Heidegger is a great example. Like he is a Nazi. He was part of the Nazi state administration. Right? He fired people based on their politics and based on their race. Right? That's what he did historically. There's absolutely no denying that. And to then say, oh, but he had certain thoughts that were different than that uh, is, is really looking for critique in the heart of um, intellectuals whose careers have been based on eradicating real critical theorists from the canon. And uh, Nietzsche is another great example. And if I could just say one final thing on this, because I've been thinking about it a lot of it lately. Foucault is somebody who says, well, critique is like what it is in Nietzsche and in Kant. These are laughable statements, quite honestly. Like Nietzsche defended a master race that was elevating an aristocracy. I mean, he wasn't even pro-capitalist. He was pro-feudalist. He was an aristocrat. He was a radical aristocrat. And the idea that you would find things in Nietzsche that could help understand the contemporary social and political world is laughable at best, which is not to say that you might read Nietzsche for other reasons, like his amoralism, and he's a great writer, and other such things, and I'm fine with that. But um, I do think, look, look where there are shells, right? Not where there's none. Trang, did you want to jump in? Thank you so much. And I think what you were just saying about um, is kind of linked to what I'm going to. Um, but before that, I just want to highlight um, 
the because this whole point we're talking about the the um, sort of sedimentary uh, layers and layers of um, different parts of reality that influence how theories and knowledge production came about and how um, you know being educated in a Western world it looks like this and uh, which might be reflecting on how I'm born Vietnamese and I grew up in Vietnam and how um, over the 20th century as a country we went from feudalism with a monarch with the monarchy to French colonialism to the war with the US to communism for about 30 40 years and now we don't know what we are right and even within that context as I I'm engaged with Western um, critical theory per se um, it, the version that to have the knowledge that the version that I'm in contact with is a sanitized version right and so it's it always brings out this idea of what, what, what is happening. I always felt something is wrong with it, but you can't really articulate what is wrong with it because here are the experts, here are the people who say, you know, this is the right thing. And so to say that, um, I think it's important to acknowledge the totalizing power of what we're dealing with and which back the question of, again, within the materialist um, frame, where are the sites or the, lo or the location for recomposition? Because the moment you get, you know, I, I'm imagining, um, and I'm also working as, as a therapist and trained in, you know, counseling and psychology, and how, you know, the only way I'm imagining right now is you have to be so small and you have to be so sort of inconsequential. Like you study something so obscure <laughs> then you can be as radical as you want to be, right? But the moment you get bigger, and this is true in academic, in nonprofit, right? You can have a small, very radicalizing organization, but the moment you get slightly bigger, then look at all the forces that come at you at full force, right? Um, including critical theory as, as a trajectory of, of line of thinking. Um, so I'm very interested in, in, in your thought about recompositioning sites, and I agree that in your article about aesthetics, uh, through films, through the arts too, but in a way, you can only almost pretending in order for the content to be received to begin with, right? Like looking at the uh, film industry of how the last in the last um, 10 years or so, the only kind of work that can have a class um, critique is when it becomes, it's everything like sorry to bother you. It has to be a thriller plus a horror plus a comedy plus many other things. It has to morph into something um, in order to be even received. That, that really great question comment um, that touches on a lot of different things. I'll just touch on the ones that were the most salient to me and then correct me if I've left something out. I think that you're right that the one of the functions of the university is to create a punditocracy, right? So this, the power of the experts and that that punditocracy then serves to police all of those below. So there's the idea that you can't be critical of Habermas if you haven't read all of Habermas. And the guy writes like, you know, 300 pages a week to make sure that you don't have time for anything else. And so there's also a temporal economy that is operative in this and a class economy because the people who have time to read are the people who have leisure time and don't have to work or work as much. And that time economy really controls how people will then relate to particular discourses. So you can't say, well, Habermas supported the first Persian Gulf War and NATO, which is an imperial organization, if ever there was one, just look at its history, because you haven't read all of Habermas, right? But you can say the same thing about M.A. Césaire, or about George Jackson, or about anyone else, right? So it also elevates people to a canonical status in which they're untouchable unless you've read everything and you've also read all the secondary literature and all the tertiary literature. I think we should be clear in identifying what exactly this is. It's an attempt to regulate the temporal economy of scholarship such that you can't call out reactionaries unless you've read all of their reactionary crap. And I assure you that if you do, probably at the end of the day, you're gonna end up being a reactionary, right? Because then you'll take your coordinates of existence from those people, right? Hannah Arendt and the, Ar uh, the Arendt scholarship would be a great example of this, right? She justified slavery, horrible positions on race, horrible positions on global imperialism. I could go on at, at great, great length. And yet there's this sense that, well, if you haven't read, you know, the, the letter that she sent privately to some Arendt scholar, then you can't say anything bad about her. 
So that also, and there's a colonial dynamic, as some of you are highlighting earlier, right? The colonial dynamic is that this is true only of the people that we've canonized. Everybody else, you don't even have to read them. That's what's great about it, right? You don't have to read George Jackson. He was just in prison. We don't have to read him. Um, the other thing that I would say is that for these larger stakes, I couldn't agree more that what we have to do is build power over time with no illusions, right? You have to build power through your own individual endeavors, through communities that you form, through collaborative efforts, through organizing spaces, through counter institutions of various sorts. But doing that, you also have to have an eye to what the, the strategy is. And you have to know full well, if you've studied the 500 year history of the conquest, which is the capitalist colonial seizure of the globe, then you need to know that when push comes to shove, they will crush you unless you have power to fight back. And that power is not a, a little community run bookshop, right? That is real power. The Vietnamese understood that. Ho Chi Minh understood that, right? Um, and that said, a final thing that I would say, and I think it's really important to recognize where you're at in a materialist analysis of the situation, identify what can be done there in the short term, the medium term, and the long term, and to always have that temporality in mind. And there are ways in which, sorry to bother you, I think has an anti-capitalist message within a film production system that itself is pro-capitalist. It knows that it's doing that in not only my opinion, but Boots Riley has basically said as much. And it's a particular genre that is a short term type of intervention, knowing full well that I think the strategy should be something like third cinema, right? Where you break with the, the studio production system, you do what Peter Watkins or Solana Singatino or others have done historically. Right? And so I also think that you can't necessarily judge all aesthetic or cultural production based on some moralizing position that, well, this is what you need to do. It's instead that people operate at different levels and they also pitch to different audiences. Right? And if you're pitching at a Heidegger conference, if you happen to need to go there for any reason, then you might be pitching to a different audience than ideally in the critical theory workshop. And that, that can shift the nature of our discourses. Um, Ellie, I saw, I think, a hand up at one point. I don't know if that's still relevant. Um, yeah, I can still pose the question. It's maybe I could reformulate it to suit sort of the trajectory of the overall conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, great. Yeah, I, so um, I guess maybe speaking to some of um, the things that other folks have contributed, which is um, to say that this is sort of about kind of what institutionalization of critical theory means and sort of in what ways we can track the various modes of ideological mediation, which are a consequence of that. So I, I f in the article, at least in the, act, the text of the article and sort of the recapitulation you gave today, I felt there was um, a lot of, the claim was sort of hinged primarily on sort of tracking the material conditions under which the institution of critical theory, either under exile diaspora conditions or um, you know, or sort of as its reestablishment in in West Germany take place, which I which I, I think is incredibly compelling, and, and frankly, is just a lot of information I didn't already have. So thanks for that. Uh, so the historiographical work really is is really important. So, but but given that, I'm sort of wondering um, what kind of is our con what is the implicit conception of what ideological mediation is and how it functions, if this kind of institutionalization sort of can so seamlessly result in these consequences, right? So I guess, in, in, let me maybe uh, explicitly illustrate what I think the stakes of this are, which is that, you know, of course, uh, all of us have to operate in, in various kinds of institutions, right? There, there are, um, of course, th there are different terms to each of those, but many of us are at least university adjacent um, or cultural arts institutions adjacent, so, you know, and the overlap there is quite large. And so I'm, I'm sort of wanting to see if we can um, make some, more internal differentiations about sort of how that mediation happens um, that might sort of introduce a bit of, of nuance or sort of a more relational approach to sort of, yeah, how we uh, find ourselves situated in relation to those institutions. Um, so if you could just say a bit more about sort of how that mediation happens, I would, I would very much like to hear it. So thanks. Great. Thank you. And I should probably qualify. I believe that you had access to a, a, one of the drafts of uh, the article that this, uh, huh. that what I presented comes from. So Ellie's also <laughs> tapping into the kind of deeper okay. argument that's made there, just so that everybody else knows that. And I'd be happy to share it with other people because it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, 
I would say two things. One is that this is definitely related to the piece that Jennifer Ponce de Leon and I uh, co-authored on a compositional model of ideology. And that is an attempt to tease out from a deep, rich internationalist tradition of Marxism an understanding of ideology that recognize that ideology is not just about the mind or ideas or worldviews in that sense. It is generated in part out of material practice, right? So what you do will give you a sense of the world that you live in and what those relations are. If you grow up with servants and you grow up going to private schools, that gives you a sense of the world. Nobody even has to tell you, right? It's that you don't cook your own food, your servants do and other such things. Or you live in an area where you hear gunshots at night and your uncle's arrested and other such things, right? Those are all material elements that compose a sense of the world that you live in. And on top of that, there are affective, libidinal, um, perceptive elements to ideology. And so one of the things that we try to do is tease out the ways in which ideology is not just about the mind, it's not just about the body, it's about the entire composition of a social subject. And that that composition is multidimensional, it's layered, and it changes over time, but usually incrementally. Meaning there's no magic button where you say, well, I'm an ideology, I was an ideology yesterday, and then I heard this lecture by Gabriel Rockhill, and guess what, I'm out. You know, I wish I could give that as a certificate, but you'll have to spend a lot more time with me. Um, you can see my therapist and how much I pay her uh, is, is, is wearing off on me. Um, I don't know why I'm making all these uh, references to that, by the way. But I do think that that compositional model of ideology gets to the temporality, the dynamism, and the social aspects of ideology, because there are some parts that we just share with another community and that are recalcitrant to change, usually if we remain within that particular community. And so if we think of the university and the way in which it operates, to survive there, you have to play particular games. And most of us like to think that we can keep our mind out of that game while just playing that game. Some of that is true, some of it's not. Meaning to play the game, you have to continually do this thing. You have to spend time reading things that you don't wanna read. You have to put footnotes in and references to narcissistic people who will feel better when they see those footnotes and other such things. All of those practices mean that we're constantly also mediating our own multidimensional ideological construction, if you will. And speaking maybe more pointedly to what it is that you raised, my critique of critical theory is obviously a kind of left critique of the institution of critical theory. It is very important historically that there's a group of intellectuals who are self-declared Marxist, for better or worse, who are doing ideology critique, who are doing an analysis of mass culture, who are bringing to the forefront really important questions. And we should not, and I take it this is one of the things that you're alluding to, we should not confuse that particular project with the whole series of reactionary war criminals who teach at uh, US institutions, right? And so, Within these struggles, there's a broad, broad spectrum. And my critique, instead of focusing on like John Wu, who wrote the torture papers and is a war criminal who's teaching at a university, and uh, you know Max Horkheimer, there are significant differences and they should be foregrounded, et cetera. But what I'm trying to do is point out the ways in which if we bracket what I'm focusing on and just look at with the university, the university has systematically eliminated the strong left. And that's been a material assault that's been very well documented um, from the Palmer raids in the interwar uh, period to the Red Purge in the post-war period to the ways in which everybody knows today if you do certain types of intellectual work, you will not get a job, right? And so all of that means that the idea that we live in a meritocracy and everyone's free to explore their ideas and the best ideas will be the ones that lead to a lucrative career are absolutely laughable. And so hopefully that speaks to some of the mediations that you're pointing out. And maybe the last thing I'd say on that is I do think it's important that some of those discourses are still on the board. Like two figures who I haven't highlighted, who I have a complicated relationship to, are uh, people like Badiou, Zizek, Ranciere to a certain extent. Right? We have two self-declared Marxists who are also self-declared metaphysicians. Uh, we have a self-declared anarchist and, and anti-capitalist in the case of Ranciere. They have, for better or worse, kept certain discourses on the table about a critique of global capitalism, about a critique of imperialism, particularly in the case of Badiou and Zizek to a certain extent. But that doesn't mean that if they're the furthest left that the academy will allow us to go, that there's not a lot further left, like a form of Marxism that doesn't believe in hocus pocus of metaphysical forms, 
or a form of radical anti-capitalist uh, organizing that doesn't condone the very reactionary political positions that Ranciere has taken on a number of precise uh, points, uh, including suggesting that the yellow vest is not about class warfare, it's about being included in the part that has no part or other such things. So that might have been too long of a response, but I feel like you were tapping into something really important. So uh, Zia Wen, I believe I saw your hand at one point. Do you want to unmute yourself and jump in? Yes, I just like wanted to add, a, um, you, you just mentioned about uh, this kind of like left and the like pedagogy thing. I want to ask about, uh, um, like I think the dilemma of like now like left wings and uh, like they are just like a more kind of like a incompetent and also kind of like a policies of like policies of the, like left wing nowadays is because of like, uh, I think like, my, my, my question is like, what is the law of like uh, intellectuals? And what does like, if like we, like I think the, the dilemma of intellectuals is like um, only one hand they think like they are anger, they think they should like, like to cultivate people and to enlighten other, like uh, people. But uh, on the other hand, they are not really like for the people because like they, do, they are not like really like normal people. They are not like really can think like the farmers or like, like the working class. So I think like, and also like I think the, the, the question about the petty bourgeoisie, I think like, uh, I think it's like a lot of like lab wings is like involved in the, the capitalist system. It's like a, a, the little uh, said the deterior, uh, deterioration is like a body without organ. And also like uh, many like uh, in 1960, uh, a lot of like uh, rebellion uh, literature uh, wave like a uh, beat generation or like uh, also like uh, uh, what else they say? Uh, uh, Czech Valor, these kind of people are more like a bohemia bourgeoisie. They are like, they, they can like talking about the uh, uh, Marxism or like West uh, Eastern ideas, but they can sit in the Starbucks or McDonald's. But actually they are like more, li this kind of liberalism is not really like uh, like like you said, like uh, the 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 college will not re really accept this kind of strong like uh, left wing, and uh, they will accept this kind of like people who think they are left wing. But this is uh, like academic left cannot really push people like or push like really can like stand for people. I think the last my question is how to jump out of this kind of dilemma of like left wings. Yeah, that's a, I mean it's a great question. It's enormous, right? What's the role of intellectuals in thinking and social transformation, but at the same time, it is at least given my social position, the question. And so I would outline just heuristically, and I've touched on this very briefly, maybe three different figures of the intellectual. The one I think that we always have to start with is the instrumentalized intellectual. The only way you become a professional intellectual is by subjecting yourself to the forms of knowledge production, circulation, and reception that are condoned by the system within which you operate. And in order to do that, you have to expend an unbelievable amount of intellectual energy um, and force to give yourself the kind of set of credentials. In doing that, you also then become the vehicle for a certain political project. And that political project is the one of capitalist colonialism, right? We don't even... I'm sure we all know the history of the, you know, the relationship between universities and the history of slavery, the history of colonialism, the history of eugenics, um, the history of structural misogyny and other such things. So I'll just like leave that as part of very important background. And it's not just history, of course, right? These are ongoing things. Um, and so the instrumentalist intellectual is really what the system wants, right? But there's another figure of the intellectual that I touched on briefly that I think is also important. And that's what I refer to as the radical recuperator. And the radical recuperator is usually someone who has been instrumentalized as an intellectual, but who can kind of sniff out what's going on, you know, and know that, well, there are these radical discourses, like in short, particularly today in the contemporary conjuncture, the radical recuperators are the ones who are sniffing out and they're like, the kids want communism. Like the kids really want communism. There is a lot of young kids and they all want, some of them call it socialism, some of it call it anarchism, some of it have different names for it, but that's what the kids want. And so how are we going to maintain our status as petty bourgeois intellectuals and instrumentalized intellectuals while nonetheless recuperating some of that radical status, but do it in such a way that we don't threaten our own position within the academy? And that's the, that's the historical function of radical recuperators, right? That they've always existed, they will always exist. And 
they sound Marxist, they speak Marxist, they use words like communism and comrade at times. But what they're really doing is recuperating that discourse within the extant system of knowledge production. They're just the left wing of that. And I would juxtapose that to a third figure of the intellectual that I refer to as, as the interventionist intellectual. And the interventionist intellectual is someone who's had to navigate this system in certain ways, shapes, or form. Uh, of course, most of, I think, the most important uh, intellectuals in the US context have worked outside of the academy. Um, I would say almost hands down. The, if you're looking for good intellectuals in 20th century America, look outside of the academy and you'll find some. Um, when you look in the academy, it's a bit of a different issue. But the interventionist intellectual might have had to navigate these structures in various ways, but is someone who is trying to marshal materialist analysis in order to understand not just the system of knowledge production, right? Because this is one thing that goes on, but also the broader system within which that system of knowledge production is nested, right? The system of capitalist social relations, the, the system of, of white supremacy and other such things but that provides a systemic and radical analysis of this, not simply in order to say, hey, look, I got this right, read my book, uh, buy my copies, et cetera, because I have the right diagnosis. This is utterly insufficient, because at the same time, that person needs to cultivate a practice that intervenes into that system, and this might be in different ways and often is in different ways, in order to contribute to a reconfiguration of that system. And if the intellectual in question is not doing that, in some radical and resolute sense, then you can be pretty certain that they're a radical recuperator, right? And there are lots of different ways of doing this. This can be someone who writes academic books, but also writes, uh, you know, pieces on contemporary politics. It can be someone who's part of a political party. It can be someone who's part of a political organization. It can be someone who's plugged into a particular community of uh, scholarly production that's outside of the academy. It can be radical artists. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing this. And often, as I mentioned earlier, and that's definitely the case in, uh, for me, there are multiple activities, right? It's not like, oh, I'm in the academy or I'm doing activism. There are multiple activities that are related to differential ways of intervening, if you will. Which brings me back to the Boots Riley reference, right? I think Boots Riley could make some third cinema, but he made a pretty awesome film within those structures. Um, but it'd be interesting, maybe he could do both. I mean, in many ways, his, his music production was kind of like third music uh, insofar as it was outside of some of the structural elements of the studio system.